crazy isn't being broken. It's you or me, amplified. Hollywood is full of examples of the quote, crazy woman, an uncontrollable, dangerous woman who's often equal parts mesmerizing and terrifying. Though in recent years, there have been more nuanced depictions of women with personality disorders on screen, mental illness is a difficult topic to portray accurately in stories written for entertainment. And just as the label crazy is itself pretty offensive, there remain many problematic or reductive versions of this trope. All you did was to destroy the dream of young women all over this country. What, you think the dream is to get blown up? You, know, you got a really good shot at the insanity point. But looking at how film and TV has portrayed the so-called crazy woman through the years can tell us a lot about what mainstream society sees as threatening and deviant, especially in females. You won't answer my calls, you change your number. I mean, I'm not gonna be ignored, Dan. Comparing a number of iterations of this character, we can see some common patterns. She's haunted by something in her past. You're a loser, Celia. Some people just don't change, do they? No, they don't. She's suffering from delusions, and her detachment from reality can make it hard for audiences to sympathize with her, especially because the screenplay frequently doesn't encourage us to understand her point of view. You are completely delusional. I'm gonna have the cops deal with your crazy ass. In fact, the crazy woman has long been villainized on screen. She's frequently portrayed as violent. And while her uninhibited behavior or unusual beauty can make her initially appealing to men... I liked having sex with him. He wasn't afraid of experimenting. Eventually, the narrative makes most characters regret getting mixed up with her. On closer inspection, this woman's issues are often caused by men, whether because someone hurt her or because she's been more systematically oppressed by stifling gender roles. She's not crazy, so don't say she's crazy. This woman cooks, sews, makes the bed, washes the bathroom. What the hell is crazy about that? Fundamentally, this character is painted as a danger to the status quo and the family unit. I don't want to lose my family. Here's our take on Hollywood's idea of the crazy woman, the forms she takes, and how she's evolving in today's representations of mental illness. I'm crazy. I'm a crazy person. There is something really wrong with me. You're watching The Take. Thanks for watching and be sure to share and subscribe. This video is brought to you by MUBI, a curated streaming service showing exceptional films from around the globe. It's like your own personal film festival streaming anytime, anywhere. Broadly speaking, we can break down the crazy woman trope into three different types. One, the obsessive woman, whose extreme violent behavior often casts her as a villain. Two, the woman having a nervous breakdown, who gradually loses touch with reality over the course of the story. And three, the cool crazy girl, whose edgy nonconformism makes it seem appealing to be unhinged. Let's start with type one, the obsessive woman. You ever find yourself being completely smothered by somebody? The obsessive woman is often a male nightmare of female craziness. Don't leave me! Don't leave me! Part of the crazy woman's power on screen is her ability to upset the social equilibrium. And one of the ways she does this is by threatening the family unit. My husband makes love to you, it's my face he sees. Perhaps the definitive example of the obsessive woman is Glenn Close's Alex Forrest from Fatal Attraction. Didn't you see Fatal Attraction? You wouldn't let me. Well, I saw it, and it scared the shit out of me. It scared the shit out of every man in America. Married protagonist Dan's no-strings affair with edgy colleague Alex no strings attached. turns out to be anything but. In fact, Alex is the original bunny boiler. <laughs> Costuming is used to cleverly signal Alex's insanity. As we become more aware of her mental state, her earlier highly fashionable 80s clothing gives way to a shapeless, white, straight jacket-like dress. When he meets Alex, Dan has the perfect life, a beautiful, doting wife, cute daughter, and successful career. How long have you been married? Nine years. I'm lucky. So what are you doing here? So why would a man like Dan risk everything for Alex? 
According to male psychology expert Dr. Herb Goldberg, achievement-oriented, aggressive, dominant, success-driven males have a very low tolerance for boredom and passivity. The crazy woman keeps them on their toes. And you're here with a strange girl being a naughty boy. This partly explains viewers' enduring fascination with a woman like Alex. We like to watch her because we, or someone we know, would be attracted to her. But Fatal Attraction sends a clear warning to anyone who might be drawn to this dangerous woman. And in the process, it issues a damaging and regressive condemnation of the single working female. Alex, the unattached, sexually emancipated career woman, challenges the traditional family structure through her very existence. I was running wiser than all the interesting guys who are always married. Well, maybe that's why you find them interesting, the fact you can't have them. And it's significant that Alex's bitter end comes at the hands of another woman, Dan's wife, Beth, who destroys this unhinged challenger to restore her own perfect family life. If you ever come near my family again, I'll kill you, you understand? Moreover, in revealing Alex's carefully constructed, carefree persona to be false, the movie implies that the emancipated career woman who wants a different kind of life doesn't really exist. She's a mirage, lying in wait to trap a man. I won't allow you to treat me like some slut you can just bang a couple of times and throw in the garbage. The obsessive woman can also be fixated on another woman. This could be because she perceives another woman as a rival for the male gaze. Then I'll be perished in the land. <laughs> or it could be because she's lacking her own sense of identity. Look, I'm not a psychopath or anything. I just want to be her friend. Come on. Your password to your phone is my sister's birthday, for sake. That's like single white female shit. In Single White Female, Jennifer Jason Lee's Hetty essentially tries to become her roommate. Everything I've done, I've done for you. Don't you understand that? The people you hated, I hated. This person can also be devoted to an idea or powered by religious zeal. Ho ho! Like would you run out to play? In Carrie, the protagonist's devoutly religious mother is so consumed with religious fear of sexuality that she psychologically tortures her daughter just for being a young woman going through puberty. I can see your dirty pillows. Everyone will. Breasts, mama. They're called breasts. Misery's Annie Wilkes is the nightmare of the angry fan. I'm his number one fan. She takes her favorite author hostage and tortures him because she's mad that he's killed off her beloved character. I know you didn't mean it when you killed her, and now you'll make it right. The obsessive crazy woman is often portrayed as violent. Now don't be afraid. Even though in reality, violent women are the exception to the rule. Perhaps because the violent mentally ill woman is an anomaly in real life, she's particularly frightening in the collective imagination. As sociologist Belinda Morrissey states in her book, When Women Kill, the female killer is the embodiment of some of Western heteropatriarchy's greatest fears. Yet it's striking that, traditionally, Hollywood has turned this woman who's suffering from severe issues into an outlet for filmmakers or audiences' misogyny, and little more than an unsympathetic, one-dimensional villain. So great to finally meet your mother. What do you mean, finally? You mean, you just met me. Fatal Attraction actress Glenn Close said of Alex and the public response to the character, quote, She's considered evil more than a person who needs help, which astounds me. In fact, test audiences disliked an original ending where Alex killed herself because they felt she wasn't sufficiently punished. Part of the problem is that, especially in a fast-moving feature film, it can be a challenge to get most audiences to relate to characters who are delusional. As author Orson Scott Card puts it in Elements of Fiction Writing, we are terrified of people who don't live in the same reality as we do. A key step toward making this character less one note is privileging her perspective. In the 1847 classic novel Jane Eyre, Jane's love interest, Mr. Rochester, is revealed to have a crazed secret wife locked in his attic. But the 1966 follow-up, Wide Sargasso Sea, and its film adaptations later tried to get inside this character's point of view, completely changing how we might view that situation. Never make promises. Why? Then they'll never be broken. In Gone Girl, the violent woman gets a chance to tell her side of the story. And while Amy remains fearsome, we're hardly encouraged to sympathize with the husband she's torturing. And my lazy, lying, cheating, oblivious husband will go to prison for my murder. 
In recent years, more nuanced, sympathetic versions of the obsessive woman are finally becoming mainstream. Lorna, on Orange is the New Black, fixates on a man she barely knows, who clearly views her as a fatal attraction-esque nightmare. I don't know this woman, okay? We went on one date. One. She's a f***ing stalker. But the show acknowledges that Lorna is suffering from a debilitating medical condition, which the actress Yael Stone has called erotomania, the delusion that someone is in love with you despite all evidence. Lorna's inability to face painful realities and failure to get the help she needs, especially after she loses a child, the kind of event that anyone would struggle to accept, that's the kind of pain that a lot of people never recover from, is treated as heartbreaking. I'm writing to my baby. The father's keeping him away from me. And when we first meet Suzanne, aka Crazy Eyes, on Orange is the New Black, she is initially feared as the violent, obsessive type through the eyes of a middle-class white woman. Because you light a fire inside me. But that first impression is completely disproven as the show devotes time to the way Suzanne has been let down by a system that's failed to treat her mental illness. Do I deserve to be here? You deserve to be in a facility that can help you with your cognitive difference. But I'm not. I'm here. As well as to her many gifts and special way of viewing the world. You're not dumb. You just got a special brain like me. She's also a notable example because on-screen explorations of mental illness so frequently overlook women of color. A second type of, quote, crazy woman on screen is the one who's in the midst of having a nervous breakdown. This story shows the character's journey into delusion, so we get more insight into why she's losing touch with reality. Crucially, this second category allows us to sympathize more with the character, in large part because her perspective is, in moments, comprehensible to us. Sometimes this type 2 narrative lets us participate in the character's mind state, making it hard for us to tell what's real and what's imagined. Other good examples of this narrative pay careful attention to the sources of the woman's distress. John Cassavetti's nuanced A Woman Under the Influence makes us feel greatly for Mabel, played by Cassavetti's wife, Gina Rollins. Do you ever think of me as, uh, as, uh, dopey? Or mean. No, you're smart, you're pretty, you're nervous too. As we closely observe her life as a neglected mother and housewife to an insensitive husband who's out of his depth and doesn't understand her needs, Roland's performance subtly illustrates how her mental deterioration is a response to her claustrophobic situation. Tell me what you want me to be, how you want me to be. I can be that. I can be anything. You tell me, Nikki. A Woman Under the Influence also belongs to a powerful subtype of this genre, the woman driven mad by living in a man's world. One of the most classic examples of the woman losing her sanity due to male cruelty is Blanche Dubois in A Streetcar Named Desire. I don't want realism, I want magic. Magic. Yes, yes, magic. Blanche's brother-in-law, Stanley, provokes her breakdown by sabotaging a potential engagement that could rescue her from dire financial straits before eventually assaulting her himself. I'm a thing but imagination and lies and deceit and tricks. And look at yourself. Take a look at yourself here in a worn-out Mardi Gras outfit. Even Blanche's snobby affectations and vanity... Would you think it possible that I was once considered to be attractive? He looks okay. Oh, it's for a compliment. are reflections of how her society's gender norms have messed with her mind by conditioning her to be dependent on male attention and forcing her to repress her true desires under a front of Southern Belle gentility. You want a shot? Uh, no, I, I rarely touch it. In 1965's Repulsion, a woman is unable to function because she's so intensely afraid of men. The aggressive male attention that follows her is indeed menacing. I just... I have to see you, that's all. And her paranoia is all the more understandable in light of the suggestion that she was abused as a child. In 2003's Monster, Charlize Theron's Oscar-winning turn as real-life serial killer Eileen Wuornos is gritty and terrifying. But it lets us understand why this sex worker is driven to murder her Johns after the extreme abuse she's experienced at the hands of men. When no one could imagine the willpower it took to do what we do. 
In 1944's Gaslight, Ingrid Bergman's character is psychologically abused by a husband who strategically plots to convince her she's going mad. If I could only get inside that brain of yours and understand what makes you do these crazy, twisted things. Gregory, are you trying to tell me I'm insane? The film, which gave birth to the term gaslighting, exemplifies what film critic Emmanuel Levy terms the don't trust your husband genre. 1968's Rosemary's Baby is a later example where it might seem like the woman is going mad. This is no dream, this is really happening! But really, she's got pretty good reasons to be upset. Her husband has joined a bunch of satanic worshippers and has impregnated her with the devil's baby. Come with us quietly, Rosemary. Don't argue or make a scene. Because if you say anything more about witches or witchcraft, we're going to be forced to take you to a mental hospital. Most recently, The Invisible Man follows Elizabeth Moss trying to prove she's not insane as her toxic husband continues to torture her seemingly from beyond the grave. Someone is, is, is doing this to me. He's, he's doing this to me. You need some medication. Adrian is dead. Another common factor in women having a nervous breakdown is aging. Sometimes the female midlife crisis story is merely a shallow condemnation of the villainous older woman whose stereotypical female sin of vanity makes her evil. But more interesting versions explore why aging is such a catastrophe for females in a society that discards women of a certain age. In Sunset Boulevard, which portrays Norma's obsession with chasing youth as grotesque, Norma, you're a woman of 50. Now grow up! There's nothing tragic about being 50. Not unless you try to be 25. The script points out how she's a product of Hollywood culture. You know, a dozen press agents working overtime can do terrible things to the human spirit. Frequently, the woman having a breakdown story leads to a larger commentary on what's truly crazy about her society. In Blue Jasmine, a modern update to Streetcar, Rich Jasmine's descent into insanity represents the delusions of the 1% and the elite lifestyle they'll do anything to protect. You can wear the Dior dress that I bought in Paris. Yes, my black dress. Well, how always used to surprise me with jewelry. In Ingrid Goes West, as the title character embarks on a quest to become real-life friends with an Instagram influencer, the story gets at the way that social media encourages us all to relate in false, unhealthy ways. We were never friends because everything about you is such a lie! You just are some weird freak that found me on Instagram! Everything about you is a lie, okay? She's crazier than him, and more fearless. The third type of, quote, crazy woman is romanticized for her devil-may-care attitude and uninhibited sexuality. Have you ever f***ed on cocaine, Nick? This character, who tends to be played by an extraordinarily attractive actress, comes across as cool because she doesn't care about what society thinks of her. I'm Tommy's crazy whore widow. Mine is a whore thing for the most part. Look at the modern interpretation of Harley Quinn. This beautiful, deranged woman has elements of Category 1's obsessiveness and Category 2's pattern of being driven mad by men. She's like a bottomless pit of, like, issues. But with her dyed hair, unique style, and backup squad of hot, angry girls and birds of prey, yeah. <laughs> she's portrayed as fun and aspirational. I mean, how do I be like you? Well, Except for the crazy part. Number one, no one is like me. Glamorous, beautiful sociopath Lisa, Angelina Jolie's character in 1999's Girl Interrupted, draws both the viewer and protagonist Susanna to her. It's good to be home! And even after Lisa's dark, evil streak is fully spotlighted, I need an ambulance. Make it a hearse. She becomes vulnerable at the end, upset that Susanna has told her, No one cares if you die. Because you're dead already. Her beauty, vulnerability, and breakability soften her, making her more attractive than challenging to audiences. I'm not really dead. Around the time when Jolie won an Oscar for this role, the actress also played up something of a cool, crazy girl persona in real life. Freedom is pretty to me. You know, so yeah, things, things that maybe are dangerous, they make you feel alive, make you feel, you know, free. This type 3 character represents an appealing level of danger to the status quo, 
She refuses to play by the rules, but she's cute and playful enough that the sense of threat isn't truly terrifying. And while her story might emphasize the gravity of her mental issues at points, I'm just the crazy slut with a dead husband! <laughs> more often than not, it tends to resolve by making her feel relatable. Even in a film like Basic Instinct, where Sharon Stone's femme fatale is clearly a murderous psychopath, the audience is encouraged to focus more on the beauty and sex appeal that make her more alluring than alarming. The cool, crazy girl underlines how central sexuality is to this trope overall. Despite her fearsome qualities, the unhinged female character is frequently very attractive to men, with some going so far as to claim that this woman is automatically better in bed. How come the deeply troubled women? Yes. You know, deeply, deeply troubled. Right. They're always the best in bed. In the past, the crazy woman type has frequently been linked to any sexual preferences that were labeled as deviant or other. The very label of crazy woman is not only offensive to people suffering from mental illness, but also has very gendered connotations. Even the word hysteria derives from the Greek for of the womb, and was historically thought to be a purely female condition. Who is it? An hysterical woman. <laughs> Are you insane? I don't take calls from hysterical women. In an article called Men Really Need to Stop Calling Women Crazy, The Washington Post's Harris O'Malley writes, Crazy is such a convenient word for men, perpetuating our sense of superiority. When women are too emotional, we say they're being irrational, crazy, wrong. What are you, a crazy woman? In the aftermath of the Me Too and Time's Up movements, women's so-called craziness and their desires to challenge and change systems that harm them are finally being perceived differently. Each time the crazy woman appears on screen, she sends a flare up, helping us to see that perhaps it's not these women who are crazy, but the society they live in. Was I ever crazy? Maybe. Or maybe life is. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell to be notified about all of our new videos. This video is brought to you by Mubi, a streaming service we love. Every day, Mubi premieres a new film, whether it's a movie you've been dying to see or one you've never heard of before. There is always something new to discover. So in this world where it's very easy to spend hours debating what you should watch, Mubi is like having a really cool friend with amazing taste in movies, making it so much easier for you. They feature hard to come by masterpieces, indie festival darlings, influential art house and foreign films, lesser known films by your favorite famous directors, and more. Plus, you can even download the films to watch offline, and there are no ads, ever. Right now on Mubi, you can check out the series Canada Now, an exclusive selection of three of the best examples of contemporary Canadian cinema. One of the featured films is One Day in the Life of Noah Pugatuk, a drama following a group of nomadic Inuits as they face off with the Canadian government. We can't recommend Mubi highly enough. You can try it out now for free for a whole month. Just click the link in the description below.